and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, wherever you are in mind, body, and spirit. Welcome to Dharma Promets Milling Matters. This is a first of three part webinar series about indexable milling. Um, before we start real quick, I would like to um, talk to you a little bit about some how to turn on the captions because this presentation is going to be in English. So we will be speaking in English, but to support your local language needs, you can change the caption language um, within the settings area, which is at the bottom right for you, bottom right. You'll see a little gear sign right here. You can go there and change the caption language to your local language. So we will be speaking in English, but you can change the caption language to your local language. And once again, we will be speaking in English, so please do not change the spoken language, but you can change the caption language to reflect the language that you would prefer. Wonderful, fabulous. So having said that, we'll, we'll mention that again for those who enter a little bit late. Um, let's get this started. So hello again. My name is Miriam Metcalf, and I am the marketing director here at Dormer Promet. And I want to welcome you to this one of three webinars about indexable milling. Um, let's go through real quick and talk safety first, because who's important? You're important. And to Dormer Promet, you're important. Your safety is very important to us. So please be in a safe zone. Know your surroundings but also be safe in mind and, and spirit. So this is a safe zone. Feel comfortable to ask questions. We will be answering the questions uh, towards the end of the webinar. Um, we wanna make sure that this is educational and informative to you, for you. So please do feel comfortable to ask questions. Let's talk a little bit about the uh, about the webinars and how you can engage with the webinars. So this is going to be a 20 minute overview of this specific topic. Today we're talking about geometries. Um, then after that we'll have we'll try to have a five minute Q and A. Uh, after this, the recording will be made available to you so you can watch it again. And please do, like I said before, engage with us, ask questions. There is a Q&A functionality at the top of the screen. So if you go to the top, there's a Q&A, you can click on that and submit your questions throughout the presentation and we will answer them at the end. Once again, live captions are being used for those of our attendees who entered a little bit late and didn't hear me you can change the captions which are being shown at the bottom into your local language and that can be done by going to the settings area at the bottom right of your screen and changing the caption language to your local language please do not change the spoken language that will continue to be english you can change the captioning language to the language that you prefer once again, um, we are very excited that you're here. This is a three part series. This is the first one and it's called Cutter and Insert Geometries. There will be two more of these and we highly encourage you to register for those and you will have registration links after uh, towards the end of the presentation will be more registration links. Um, there we do have a comprehensive team of product application and sales team members around the world to support you. Um, this webinar series is kind of intended to, you know, grab your coffee, grab your tea, your water. Um, this will hopefully inspire you to get your milling mindset on for the day. We have two presenters who will be with, with us throughout these webinars. Today we have our colleague, Eric Geringer. Uh, he is our product and application manager, and he is going to be presenting today. Uh, at subsequent webinars, we will have Christian Andert, and he is our training specialist. He is not able to be with us today. You will be seeing him later on at one of the other webinars. So without further ado, that was a little bit about the webinars. Let me pass it over to my amazing colleague, Eric, and he can get started with the webinar. Thank you so much, Eric. Yeah, thank you, Miriam. Uh, hello, everybody. Hope everybody's having a good day. Um, 
so so let's get started. We'll we'll uh, kind of kick this off with a, a small introduction about milling, uh, and then we'll get into some of the details. Um, and uh, uh, please, if you have the questions, uh, pl please put them in. So um, so face milling. Um, when you think about face milling, it's probably one of the most popular uh, milling applications that you see. Typically, you're going to use a lead cutter is what we would call. It has some kind of a lead angle on it. Uh, customers are usually using this for, uh, you know, uh, roughing applications from time to time, even finishing applications. Uh, and uh, very, very common. One of the most common types of milling cutters used. You get into uh, the next application of shoulder milling. You know, uh, again, one of the most widely used milling cutters in the market. Um, you see these types of cutters on all types of machines from, from the conventional bridge ports all the way to the five axis CNC machines. Uh, very, very versatile cutters. You're typically machining two surfaces with a shoulder mill. That's why they're so popular. Uh, you're typically doing a face operation and a shoulder application, uh, a side milling at the same time. Uh, you also have a little flexibility with these cutters as well that uh, some of the other cutters don't lend themselves quite so well to when it comes to helical boring and ramping uh, and uh, applications such as that. And also uh, within the shoulder milling family, we have uh, what a lot of people call the uh, long edge cutters or corn cob cutters where the inserts will be up the side of the insert when you have those long edging uh, types of applications. And then another area uh, to focus on, and uh, we talk about copy and high feed mills, uh, a lot of similarities and a lot of common uh, features there. Typically, when you think about copy mills, you're, you're typically doing a lot of uh, maybe dyeing mold work or, or profiling 2D, 3D surfaces. Uh, usually, we're talking about round inserts um, with varying depths of cut. Um, and then when you get into the high feed mills, you're typically talking more applications uh, or, or inserts that are maybe square or an odd shape, but usually typically with like a large radius on the end of it. So it's mimicking using a round insert, but giving you a little more stability in the, in the pocket. The next application area or, or types of cutters kind of uh we lumped several of them together we're thinking you know we're talking about disc cutters or t-slot cutters as sometimes they're called uh, and chamfer mills and you know one of the things i always like to bring up is about chamfer mills it's, it's one of the most probably overlooked types of applications uh that that's used um you know a lot of customers have uh uh Chamfers they put on bar uh, on, on material or even edge rounding, uh, ed, you know, uh, to to soften that blow so they don't get edge frittering or chipping of the edges. Okay, so Miriam, let's let's talk about cutter geometry now. So again, um, we get into the cutter geometry a little bit, and this picture does a great job of showing where the insert actually contacts into your workpiece. So if you look at that bottom left hand corner there, you'll see that cutter with the little uh, kind of red, blue, gray and red dots. And I really like this picture because it gives you a really good idea of as that cutter is sweeping in from picture one uh, to two to three to four, as that cutter sweeping in, how is it physically contacting your workpiece? Um, and then we get into. Um, the uh, different types of cutter geometries. So we think about um, what type of cutter do I want to use? And when you think about that, think about uh, your application area. So we, you know, we talk about double positive cutters uh, where your axial and radial rake of your cutter is on positive angles. And, you know, it's traditionally you're going to see single sided inserts here. Um, and when you get into your, you got a low horsepower machine, you need free cutting abilities. Uh, you have material that may work harden, such as a super alloy. Uh, these are the kind of cutters that you want to use. And these cutters will typically give you really, really good surface finishes. Uh, the next style of cutter that's very popular that we see a lot of is what we call a double negative cutter. These cutters typically have a double sided insert. To give you a little more economy, they're going to give you a little stronger cutting edge. 
Um, and also, you can typically run higher feed rates with these type of cutters because they have that stronger edge. They have that stronger pocket geometry built into the cutter body itself. And then the, the third style would be a positive, what we call a positive negative cutter. So when we think about that, we think about our force AD cutter, um, uh, the AP style cutter or, or AP style insert, which is the uh, uh, rectangular shape parallelogram type insert. Um, that cutter is one of the most common cutters in the market. Um, you see those cutters in every shop, uh, every customer I've ever been in in the world. Um, and these cutters do a fantastic job. Uh, and I, I think that's why they're so widely used and so versatile. They will actually pull the chip as it's cutting away from the workpiece. Um, so th that one gives you the, the surface finishes. It gives you the versatility and the flexibility. Uh, and then the last style is a negative positive, um, which is, a, it's, uh, I say, a, probably one of the most uncommon style of cutters where you see those types of inserts, uh, typically a single-sided insert that's tipped backwards uh, or on a negative rake. Um, so, and, and that jump geometry from time to time does come into play, especially when you're trying to push your cutting forces down into a workpiece. Uh, the, the negative side of that, though, is it's going to also cause that chip to flow down and beat your work beat back into the workpiece. So you could have some surface finish issues. So keep that in mind. OK, and then next we'll talk about the direction of the uh, tangential forces that these different style of cutters create. So, you know, th this is um, uh, this is a really good picture. It kind of gives you an idea. And so we picked a, a 45 and a 43 lead cutter here to kind of give you an example to show you the different types of cutting forces that you would see. So this is one of it's a very critical component of when you're selecting the cutter and how to select the right cutter. And then also a thing to consider is is like in this example with a workpiece vise is to make sure you're feeding back into the stop of the vise and not into the adjustable jaw side. Yeah, so, um, and then uh, the, let's, let's speak about the setting angle and chip thinning and how it relates to this as well. So here, uh, th this is probably, I'd say, some of the most common geometries that we'll see in the market. And, and I know when we talk about uh, 90 degree shoulder milling, the, the picture kind of goes a little further here. And it gives you a really good example of the cutting forces and what your machine sees as it's machining the workpiece. So with a 90 degree cutter, as you can see from the red arrow, you will get those side cutting forces uh, that go back. You know, uh, you're putting that side cutting force more into your workpiece and into your spindle uh, it, of your machine tool. And then when you move to a 45 degree lead, you can see how those those cutting forces move back up at an angle. So you're changing that cutting force, putting more back up into the spindle and the spindle housing of the machine. And then when we talk about a 20 degree lead cutter or a high feed cutter, and, and I know some of the angles on high feed cutters vary from 10 degrees to 25, 20, 22, 25 degrees, but it gives you a really good example on, on for this example, where it really puts, puts pushes the cutting forces back up into the spindle. Um, you know, and and that becomes kind of, you know, these, these cutting forces really come into play when you start thinking about fixture rigidity, workpiece rigidity, your spindle machine tool rigidity, and your machine tool horsepower. So if you have bad spindle bearings, these are some, some of the things you always want to take into effect because that will begin to affect your uh, surface finishes and also your tolerancing. So one thing to keep in mind as well, you know, with a round insert, we talk about the cutting forces. And this is one of the one of the South cutters that you can change the cutting forces by changing your depth of cut. Uh, so and then also uh, uh, at the bottom of the page here, you'll see the the formulas for calculating your your uh, your chip thinning. And uh, this those will help you actually get your chip thickness uh, to calculate your proper feed rate. 
So one of the things that I always, always, always want to bring to customers' uh, uh, perspective or their view is, you know, anytime you have a lead type cutter, when you're talking a 45 degree lead or a high feed cutter, like a 20 degree we used in this example, you always have chip thinning. So you can, your program feed rate is not your chip thickness that you're actually seeing uh, as you're as you're machining. So typically, uh, the example I typically use is uh, the 45 degree lead cutter. You know, th there's the formula of the 0.71. Uh, you would divide your your feed rate by that. So if I was running a 0.2 feed, I'm going to divide that by or 0.2 per tooth. You would divide that by the 0.71, and you would come up with something around 0.25 to 0.3. And that would give you actually a, a heavier programmed feed rate into the machine tool itself. So, but that's super important. It will make you more productive. And it will also, in, in some instances, increase your tool life as well, because you don't want to get that chip load too low. And you're, then you're, you're, you're causing rubbing instead of the actual clean cutting action that the cutter is designed to do. So, and then let, let's, we'll move into the um, cutter density and the impact the cutter density has. So one of the things I like to think about when I'm thinking about cutter density is what does that really mean? So it's the distance between the inserts. So I know if I have a low horsepower machine, I'm thinking, okay, I'm probably going to have to have a coarse pitch cutter. Um, and then an instance to where maybe I'm working in a foundry or uh, a Ford shop where they have some really nasty applications. It's going to be a high ho horsepower draw. You know, those are the type of applications you would think about when you're wanting to select a coarse pitch cutter, maybe even a medium pitch in some instances. But you want the cutter body to have that extra strength, that extra support behind the insert. That's what a coarse pitch cutter is going to do for you. Um, you get into the medium pitch cutters. Those are the most uh, widely used, and in most applications, this would be your first choice cutter. Um, you typically have your, your larger chip gullets, chip clearance areas, so you don't have to worry about like those softer type materials, the lo those low alloy steels, uh, chip jamming or galling the side of your cutter, or even some of the chip deflecting, uh, damaging your workpiece. So again, so you still have a lot of support in the in the pocket body itself, but also it's going to give you a few extra teeth, so it's going to make you more productive. And then last but not least, of course, is the fine pitch cutter or a heavy pitch cutter, you will hear it called as well. So when you get into the, the fine pitch or a heavy pitch cutter, it's going to be the most inserts that will actually fit into that cutter, cutter body. Now, some things to be aware of there. You're going to get a, a, a thinner uh, chip uh, chip gullet. You're also going to have less support behind the insert. So if you're running, uh, you know, typically like uh, cast irons or short chipping materials, you know, maybe such as like a brass, these cutters would be a, a really good first choice because uh, they're going to give you the higher feed rates and and typically a little more stable um, with, with with those types of materials. But now if you talk about you want to do like a low alloy steel, you would risk the 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 chip jamming from those gum, you know, that gummy type materials wanting to uh, stick and not evacuate because of the smaller chip clearances. So um, and then on to um, uh, the differential pitch cutters. And what does that mean versus a. Uh, a, a Sorry, I lost my word, a regular pitch cutter. Sorry about that. So uh, if you notice the picture to the left, you know, how does that geometry control the vibration and reduce chatter? So when you think about vibration, it's, it's regenerative. So it repeats itself. So when I have a cutter that has even insert spacing, it, you're going to see the same frequency, the same harmonics over and over and over. So the nice thing about milling is, we also offer differential pitch cutters, which the inserts will have unequal spacing. Okay, so the benefit of that, as you can see in the in the below uh, graph to the left, you see those harmonics or that wave is higher and lower 
you have peaks and valleys. So you're spreading those harmonics and you're, you're creating a different frequency level to reduce that chatter. And that way you have, you have a cleaner, better surface finish. So a couple things there, um, you know, that that's the differential pitch cutter is a fantastic kind of first step when you might, when you, uh, have, um, any kind of vibrations, harmonics, you know, there's a few other actions you can take. You can typically increase your feed rates or reduce your RPMs. Uh, that heavier feed sometimes will help uh, with the chatter. Uh, and also, you know, the, the biggest recommendation I always make to people is make your tool as short as possible. You know, uh, you want that tool assembly, that adapter, uh, that interface between the spindle of the machine and to the tip of the cutting edge as short as possible. Uh, and then always think about your fixture rigidity. Always try to machine into your fixture stops. Uh, and then, you know, last but not least, one, one of the recommendations is uh, if you do have uh, vibrations or you're not getting the surface finish you want, one of the things I always try is actually looking at your cutter path. How are we moving into the workpiece? How are we engaging the part? How are we moving off the workpiece? Uh, are we getting any deflection coming from the machine tool or from the spindle? So those are some just some really quick tips uh, there. And then last but not least, uh, selecting your insert. So we get into, you know, insert geometries and grades, and, and this becomes uh, uh, almost overwhelming. But, you know, a lot of times when we think about the, the corner radius or the radius of the insert, your workpiece a lot of times will dictate that, especially when it comes to shoulder milling. Uh, you know, and then when you get into more of the lead cutters, the geometry has a, a larger uh, BS or a larger flat on the end. So not as critical there. But, you know, you get into the different types of geometries, you want to really think about, OK, what surface finish do I need? Is this a roughing application? Is it a finishing application? Um, and every concept out there will have multiple options um, for you to choose from. So if if you were doing roughing material, you would not want to use a F chip breaker because it's going to be up sharp. It's going to give you that sharper, crisper cutting, and it's going to create a better surface finish. And then when you think about more along the lines, if you look in the bottom right hand corner there, you'll see a picture of our of a RCMT insert that has a, a, a roughing uh, geometry on it. And you can see that large land and then that negative 0.2 land to create that stronger cutting edge so you can run those higher feed rates. But again, be aware, you run those roughing geometries, your surface finishes are typically gonna be lower or uh, not as good. So, uh, and then, uh, you know, for me, last but not least for sure, is always consider your grades. Uh, the geometry will help support that. But a lot of times when you get into finishing applications, the insert grade comes into effect as well. So you have your harder grades and your softer grades. So you want to just be aware of that and, and keep, keep that kind of in the front of your mind. And then also uh, when you get into the materials, th those will play a huge impact into your grade selection as well. So with that, I would like to turn it back over to Miriam. Hello and welcome back. Eric, thank you so much for that. Well done. Um, hopefully everybody found that some informative. Um, we do have, um, we have about five minutes left in today's inspirational milling webinar. Um, and so we have some time for some questions and we do have a couple. So let's get to some questions here. And um, Eric, I'm gonna, you know, get your cup of coffee because some of them, let's hope they're not too challenging. I don't know. Um, but we I'll have one here. For, okay, you're gonna do a fabulous job. You're gonna do a fabulous job, Eric. Um, for shoulder milling with 90 degree cutters as TNGX 16, we couldn't reach the best surface that we desire. What is the effect of the cutter selection on the, in that case? Or do you have any tips? So it it absolutely depends on the 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 material being machined, uh, and also the cutter pitch. If if it's a finishing application, which I'm assuming it would be in this kind of application, you would want to use the finest pitch cutter we have, and we would also want to look at an insert with typically like a larger radius. 
And then you need to look at your uh, speeds and feeds. If d depending on the surface finish requirements, you could want to run a little bit uh, higher uh, surface meters uh, to generate that that uh, kind of smoother finish that the customer's looking for. Got it. Excellent. Thank you so much, Eric, for that. Hopefully, uh, whoever asked that question, um, we answered that question for you. And if not, uh, we're always going to be here to answer it in more detail if you need yeah, more please. information. Yeah, please. Um, yeah, please. Sorry. Please reach out yeah. if if uh, you do need more help. 100% fabulous. Uh, so we do have another question here as well. Um, what is a good what is a good rule when determining whether to use carbide inserts? For milling over solid carbide. That's that's a really good one. So so typically, I always recommend use indexable where possible. Uh, it's typically more economical for customers, uh, and it will give you a little more consistency as well. Uh, however, there are applications you're going to have to use uh, solid carbide. Uh, even sometimes you have to step back and maybe using HSS or, or cobalt, depending on your length of cut. But Think about those smaller, uh, smaller diameter uh, uh, opportunities to where maybe you need a half inch or, or even smaller uh, or 20 millimeter, uh, 10, 12 millimeter uh, end mill. You know, when you get into those die and mold applications, when you're contouring parts or you have a small wall or you need a uh, on the side of it, you're doing a side milling application. Those are typically they lend themselves more to the solid carbide applications and less towards the indexable. And that's just comes a lot of that comes from the repeatability of the uh, indexable inserts. You know, with that carbide, it's all ground at one time on, on a grinder. And, you know, the, the inserts are typically within a 25 to 50 micron tolerance band uh, when you are uh, looking at insert to insert and repeatability. Got it. Fabulous. Thank you so much. And then one final question before we wrap it up for today in our final two minutes. Um, do you have uh, PCD inserts which are suitable for these type of cutters? Can you provide guidance, uh, Eric? So so we we do have a limited PCD selection. Uh, like the, it just depends on the cutters, uh, but it is it is a limited selection. So I, I would always recommend you for, for the selection. You, I could refer you to the website or even reach out to your local dormer primate rep. Got it. Fabulous. And that's a wonderful segue for looking for more information. So thank you so much, Eric. And to the uh, the attendee who asked that question, please do contact your local sales team member or you can reach out directly to Eric. He's here for you wherever Thanks. you are in the world with his milling expertise to support you. Um, we, can, we also have Christian uh, who will be, like I said, at other webinars. So reach out to either of them. Um, you've got their contact details. Um, as well as uh, through LinkedIn as well. Um, you can go on our website, browse our assortment online. Eric was talking today about our, our solid milling, uh, solid carbide milling assortment as well. So you can do our indexable milling uh, or that. Um, and then of course, register for our next webinars. We have two more webinars in this series. Um, a link has been shared. You can register for it now. Um, and as well, after this, you can rewatch today's webinar. So having said that, thank you so much for your time today. Be safe, be well, be happy, be healthful, and be successful in what you do. And thank you, Eric, for all of your support with Milling Matters. Yep. Thank you for having me. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Bye-bye. Have a go. great day. Have a wonderful day. Be safe, everyone. Bye-bye.